Jim Locke and I will be spending the next four hours uh, giving you an introductory workshop to family-based treatment for adolescents with anorexia nervosa. And we will divide the presentation into these five uh, sections. Firstly, uh, giving you an idea of the background of the family-based treatment model. Uh, very briefly, uh, review the evidence again uh, to point out that uh, the keynote address contains a far more elaborate version of the second section of this presentation. So that will just be literally uh, running a sprint through the available studies just to refresh our memories. The third part will be uh, looking at the fundamental assumptions uh, of this treatment approach before we go on to uh, a more detailed look at the three phases of treatment uh, and depending on our time and given the fact that this is an introductory workshop, uh, we will be doing uh, at least uh, one role play during that uh, section of the presentation. And then we'll close with some uh, thoughts, uh, Q&A, uh, talk a little bit more about uh, training opportunities uh, and just general discussion. Uh, a second point I want to make before we get going is that this is a mini workshop. So the idea is not for Jim and I to uh, be doing a didactic, uh, but for you and us to interact with each other. So please feel free to uh, put your hand up, interrupt, ask questions, and we'll try and keep those discussions brief, but we do not want to discourage you from uh, doing so while we are um, doing this presentation. So let's look at the first part of uh, this presentation then. And just to give you an idea of how uh, we will be formatting uh, the workshop is that there are, as I just pointed out, certain sections to this presentation and Jim and I will go back and forth in terms of who is presenting that particular piece but there will be some interaction uh, between the two of us to either additions or uh, uh, clarifications that we may want to add to each other's uh, sections. So let's look at the family-based treatment model uh, of uh, this approach that's also known as the Maudsley approach. Uh, and for many reasons, uh, we prefer to look at this treatment and use the, the uh, descriptor family-based treatment because we think it's a better way of describing the actual interventions that characterize this, uh, in this intervention or this uh, treatment modality. Uh, also that uh, the Maudsley Hospital is a building uh, and therefore not necessarily the best descriptor uh, and the uh, parents of this approach uh, would also uh, feel that uh, it's not the best way to describe this treatment. So let's uh, stick to the uh, descriptor of family-based treatment or FBT for short. So where does FBT come from? Uh, and Back in the, the 80s uh, at the Maudsley Hospital in London, uh, where most adolescents with anorexia nervosa, I probably would say uh, just about everyone, was uh, admitted to the inpatient uh, unit for weight restoration. A very effective way of uh, managing uh, anorexia nervosa, not necessarily a very good way to uh, provide uh, a background to a longer term uh, good outcome. Be that as it may, uh, the feeling was very strongly held within the Maudsley team that if you hospitalize a child, at least two things will happen. Uh, the, the adolescent and their family will probably find that experience as very traumatic. Um, and if we can avoid that, then we should try and do so. Uh, but secondly, uh, more so than anything else, perhaps, uh, to admit your child to be refed by someone else is a very profound way to disempower parents. Unintentionally, but nevertheless, uh, parents would be more than happy to defer to a professional if their child needs a tonsillectomy. They shouldn't attempt it at home, and they don't feel disempowered when they take their child to the hospital and have a professional uh, perform that procedure. Um, but to have your child be in the hospital and be fed by someone else uh, is really a thump in the stomach to most parents because that's something that most parents do pretty well. And these parents did pretty well too until this illness came along. So if we can prevent the trauma of hospitalization, 
uh, especially when it's avoidable. Uh, and if we can prevent disempowering parents, we may in fact give this family and this adolescent a far better chance uh, at a good outcome. And so that was sort of at the heart of, of this approach. And as I mentioned, uh, developed in the 1980s uh, at the Maudsley Hospital in London. Fortunately, since then, a lot of work has been done to further develop and refine uh, this treatment. Uh, and various centers now um, have been involved in that refinement uh, across North America and other parts of the world. And among these would be uh, Chicago, London, Melbourne, Mount Sinai in New York, Stanford, Sydney, and, and others. So that's very uh, um, encouraging to see that this treatment has indeed uh, been uh, taken off uh, in a way that allows us to look at it more closely uh, and adapt it for a variety of settings and diagnoses within eating disorders. It takes a couple of, of key strategies or interventions from a variety of schools of family therapy. Um, and the few that we put up there uh, would only be some of the major schools of, of thought that influenced the, the original approach. Uh, and Mnuchin's structural family therapy probably uh, would be the easiest to identify uh, in FBT. But certainly Salvini Palazzoli's work from the Milan School, Haley's strategic family therapy, and most definitely Michael White's narrative uh, therapy uh, would be uh, clearly on display uh, in this work. So it's very much a combination of what is practical, what is appropriate, uh, and what will get the family from A to B, rather than a strict adherence to any one particular school of thought. And that really introduces the very next point in terms of uh, what does FBT look like. And that um, it's at its uh, most fundamental uh, um, core, theoretically agnostic. It really frees the clinician from having to be uh, adherent to one particular way of thinking. Uh, instead, you make no assumptions about the origins of the disorder uh, and you focus on what can be done in the moment. Uh, so the emphasis is very much on uh, symptom relief uh, and weight restoration from the outset before you would be looking at any other psychosocial issues or uh, psychological developmental or adolescent developmental concerns that would be uh, reviewed uh, only in the latter part of treatment. And we'll talk about the three phases uh, as we go on here. So the parents, contrary to either popular belief or uh, other schools of psychotherapy or thinking about uh, psychopathology, the parents are not to blame. They are seen as the biggest resource uh, in the recovery of their offspring. Um, and as much as the parents are not to blame, likewise, the adolescent is not to blame. He or she did not wake up one morning and pick this illness in order to make uh, their family life uh, a living hell. Uh, instead, it is viewed very much in the same way as any other medical disorder that you happen to be diagnosed with a certain virus or a certain malignant tumor, uh, and we need to pull our resources together to address these concerns. The siblings uh, uh, are given a very specific task uh, in that they're not, they protect it from the job that the parents are assigned to do, which is in the first phase of treatment, uh, weight restoration. Their job is to provide uh, general support uh, for their sibling outside the role of refeeding. And what that means in practice, and again, we will go into this in a little bit more detail, is that while the parents are uh, may, mostly focused on weight restoration, the sibling's job is to provide their sibling with a distraction, uh, comforting outside mealtimes. Mealtimes are the parents' job, uh, post mealtime, go to Facebook, watch a movie together, do the kinds of things that siblings are supposed to be doing. So who is this treatment? Who is FBT suitable for and in what kind of a context? It's not a panacea. Uh, both Jim and I are very clear that while the data is very encouraging, uh, it is nevertheless a treatment that has its limits. And uh, for the most, it's appropriate for children and adolescents who are medically stable and fit for outpatient treatment. Um, and within that group, of course, not everyone will respond to this treatment either, but that's the, the broad 
context within which this treatment should be implemented. So it's an outpatient intervention. Uh, and although it's a very complex intervention at some level, if you want to distill it to the key elements, then it is to restore the adolescent's weight, in other words, doing the job that the, parent, the nurses would have done if the adolescent was admitted to a specialist inpatient unit. And once that goal has been achieved, to help the parents, help the adolescent get back on track with his or her adolescent development. So it's not overlooking that piece, it just orders it in this way that first the medical crisis needs to be addressed and then we look at the psychological piece. So secondly, FBT is always a team approach. Uh, eating disorders are far too complex for a single provider to be capable necessarily to address all these concerns. Uh, and so the primary therapist would be doing FBT, but is supported very closely by the pediatrician who monitors the adolescent's uh, medical well-being and uh, makes sure to give the FBT therapist the green light that the patient is fit for outpatient treatment and continues to remain fit for outpatient uh, treatment. And then in the case of psychiatric comorbidity, which is sadly very true for a good 50%, of our patient population, a child and adolescent psychiatrist who would be monitoring that piece. Um, hospitalization, therefore, is not part of the treatment because this, as I said, is an outpatient intervention, but if anyone becomes medically unstable during the course of outpatient FBT, uh, we would uh, have a brief inpatient stay to resolve the medical concerns. And the patient would return to outpatient treatment once that has been taken care of. So briefly, what does FBT look like? In terms of treatment style, it's a treatment that puts the parents very much in charge of weight restoration at the beginning of treatment. Uh, many would say, well, that sounds a little awkward, that parents should have this kind of control over an adolescent who uh, is negotiating independence. I fully agree with that, uh, but this being a medical crisis, uh, and the parents are engineered to come to the child's rescue, uh, it's very appropriate control which is temporarily engineered and ultimately relinquished as soon as is practically possible. Uh, and that happens usually within three months uh, and I think Jim and I can count the families on uh, a, a collective one hand who sees this treatment as a green light to be that involved in their child's life. Uh, it's a considerable commitment on the part of parents, a commitment that most parents are happy to deliver because no one cares and loves for the adolescent more so than the parents. Um, but at the same time, it really turns uh, family life upside down in terms of being available 24-7. Uh, there are other kids in the family, there are other commitments that they have to balance, there's career, there's relationships. Uh, so parents are by and large very keen to move out of phase one into the phase where they hand the control uh, back to the adolescent in an age-appropriate fashion. So the therapist stands as the second point is one of actively mobilizing the resources that every family presents with. Now not every family presents with very with an abundance of resources uh, or that's uh, clearly visible to you as the clinician. In fact most, most families present present like families do, with all the dirty laundry and uh, other issues right there for us to see as mental health professionals. Uh, our job is not to over-pathologize or pathologize, period, but to look for the resources that we have to mobilize as clinicians to help this family overcome this tremendous obstacle in their way towards the health and individuation of their offspring. And the onus is on us as the clinicians to find those resources because they do exist. Very few parents have absolutely no resources. In fact, I've never seen a family who doesn't have something that we can pull together as clinicians and help support them to move things forward. So you really have to take a very active uh, stance in, in your work. Um, you provide the family with ideas about how to go about doing this, but always with great deference to the parents in terms of the firm, uh, in keeping with a firm belief that most parents know what they're doing. And it's very easy as a clinician to get sidetracked in thinking that they don't know what they're doing because when they come to your office, they're really quite besides themselves and not knowing how to take care of their offspring who has anorexia. But don't forget, they may have one or two other, three other kids who are doing perfectly well. 
And until this illness came along, even the, 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 the adolescent with anorexia was doing well too. So clearly these parents know how to take care of their children. They have just been uh, quite bamboozled by this illness in regards to this one uh, offspring and not quite knowing how to overcome this very confusing, uh, uh, omnipotent, very powerful, uh, persuasive presence of, of anorexia nervosa. Thirdly, the uh, adolescent is obviously treated with great respect. Uh, even though you try and engineer the parents to initially temporarily take control of, of the eating, uh, which is almost always developmentally inappropriate at some level because you don't typically tell a 16-year-old what to eat or put that in front of him or her. Um, but you commiserate with the adolescent that there's this illness that has taken freedom around eating temporarily away from her. And what we're trying to do is not to thwart uh, his or her adolescent development, but to take the eating disorder out of the way so that the adolescent can go on and uh, uh, embark on adolescent development unencumbered by the presence of the eating disorder. And so in that sense, it really turns more traditional treatment upside down, that the potency of the treatment is within the parents before you eventually, at the end of treatment, turn to the adolescent and look at psychosocial and, and uh, developmental concerns. The detail of this uh, treatment model uh, can vary depending on the context, depending on the severity and age of the, the patient you, you are being presented with. Um, so the dose is typically uh, 6 to 12 months uh, at an intensity or, or session intensity of 10 to 20 sessions as per the manual over that time period. Um, and for the most, it's conducted in a conjoint format, which means that everyone who lives under the same roof would be uh, called upon to attend the treatment. Uh, but certainly, it can be implemented uh, as effectively in a more diluted way, if you like, uh, at least in terms of, of person power, uh, and looking at the adolescent and the parents working together, but side by side, uh, in a separated format and not engaging directly at least the rest of the family. So I, I briefly mentioned three phases and I'm just going to review with you these three phases in five seconds because we're going to go to that in more detail down the road. So FBT is always divided into three phases. Uh, and these three phases, if we look at the 20 treatment model, then uh, we have the bulk of the work in phase one, which is where you help the parents uh, get uh, a handle on how to be the primary agents of weight restoration. And so that will be about 50% of the uh, treatment um, dose. Once the weight of the adolescent has gone up from, say, on average around 80% of expected body weight to around 90% of expected body weight, and there's a change in the mood of the family, so to speak, a rather subjective measure, um, you would be ready to move into the second phase of treatment, which is aimed at handing control of eating back to the adolescent. Again, in an age-appropriate fashion. That will look very different for an 11 or 12-year-old as it would for someone who's 16, 17, or 18. And the, the treatment should be developmentally sensitive to tailor it to the uh, appropriate stage of adolescent development that the patient finds himself in, as well as the degree to which the illness has interrupted uh, the adolescent development, as well as sensitivity to the family's practices around uh, eating uh, and uh, child rearing and accommodating adolescent um, independence in their families. And then once you've achieved that second goal of treatment, which is to hand the control back to the adolescent, you'd be ready to move into the third phase. By this time, you meet with the family every second, third, or even fourth week. And it's really to review uh, how Eating, the eating disorder interrupted adolescent development, what are the tools that the family and the adolescent now have uh, in order to embark on adolescent development uh, without the eating disorder and without your help as a clinician. So this treatment is one that very much strives to put the parents in charge or the family in charge of life uh, very quickly uh, and not over psychotherapize, if there's such a word, uh, the family or the adolescent for that matter. Now, no doubt, there will be more chronic cases or cases with a, a, a complex uh, comorbid profile that would require uh, 
perhaps additional uh, treatment for other concerns or uh, cognitive um, uh, functioning that looks pretty much the same as it did when the weight was uh, in the 70% range of expected body weight or a budding axis too that would require additional work. But those are the exceptions, fortunately. I think for the bulk adolescents who have been unwell for a relatively short period of time, once they're given the opportunity to get back on track, life takes over and the family uh, can move them along uh, the road of adolescent development. And that's the, the work that is uh, looked at in the third phase of treatment. So I'm going to uh, just uh, go over the evidence base very briefly uh, before we move on to the third part of the, the uh, presentation. And as a reminder, I'm going to do this very briefly because uh, for those of you who haven't watched the uh, keynote piece that is a far more elaborate uh, uh, presentation of the evidence base, uh, by all means do so. This is just to remind you of where this treatment comes from when it comes to scientific evidence. As a, a, a precursor to the next five or six slides, um, this is not a, selective, a selection of uh, available RCTs for adolescents with anorexia nervosa. The next six slides are the only published RCTs for adolescents with anorexia nervosa. Again, it's not a se selection of uh, the, only the psychotherapy trials. Uh, it's a selection of everything. It's an inclusive presentation of everything that has been uh, published so far. Uh, so there's nothing in the realm of uh, uh, pharmacotherapy RCTs. There are no combination uh, pharmacotherapy uh, psychotherapy trials uh, that have been published yet. These are the six published RCTs that all focus on psychotherapies. And they, I'm presenting them in the order, time order in which they were conducted uh, and published. Starting uh, with a seminal work at the Maudsley Hospital Again, I'm going to keep it brief because it's available in more detail in the keynote. Uh, this was the first study published in 1987 with a five-year follow-up. And uh, the long and short of this is that a subgroup of the 80 patients were adolescents with anorexia nervosa with a duration of illness less than three years and the onset of the illness before the age of 19. This is the only subgroup for which there was a significant finding. Uh, and after a period of about three months, uh, 12 weeks of hospitalization, weights uh, were uh, restored from about 65% of, of expected body weight to around 90. And at that point, they were randomly allocated to family therapy or FBT or individual support of psychotherapy for a 12 month period of weight, uh, of sort of uh, weight maintenance or further improvement treatment post hospitalization. And just looking at weight, and there are other parameters too to confirm that family therapy was significantly better than the individual psychotherapy. Uh, at five year follow up, so this slide goes up to this time point there, and at a, in an open follow up, which means that everyone can go about their merry way and followed up five years later, those patients who were originally in family therapy continued to do pretty well and were weight restored and those who were, who were originally in individual psychotherapy made some improvements too, but again, that difference was statistically significant and in favor of family therapy. Daniel, I just want to point out something on that, those slides that I'd like people to see. In the five-year follow-up slide, um, at the three-year point, it took three years, essentially, for the patients in the individual therapy to reach this point where um, they were approximately uh, uh, close to where they were at discharge. And at the five-year point, they are essentially at the same point at one year that the family treatment group was at. And these are adolescents with a mean age of about 14. So that's a period of growth. It's a period of Im important development. Being ill with anorexia for those five years, even if you get weight restored ultimately, you have built up and accumulated both um, physical and psychological and social um, uh, <coughs> developmental encumberments that are going to really um, have a longer uh, impact than the low weight itself. So 
it's, it, I just don't like the message to be, oh, well, the individual therapy patients ultimately caught up. I like it to be actually, they took a really long time to even to get weight restored. That's just a point I'd like to emphasize there. So the second study <coughs> uh, was also conducted at the Maudsley Hospital. And this time, uh, if patients were deemed to be medically stable, they weren't admitted to the inpatient unit first. Uh, the idea was now, um, if, if you can remember the earlier slide that I talked about, uh, let's prevent hospitalization and let's try and minimize parental disempowerment. Um, so the idea here was that if you're medically stable, then you'd be seen as an outpatient and let's see whether the parents can do the job that the nurses would have done if that adolescent was in the inpatient setting. And folks were randomly allocated to one or two forms of family-based treatment, either conjoint, uh, and it doesn't really matter which one of those two lines they are because uh, they did pretty much the same, or separated. So conjoint is the way we talk about it in this workshop. Everyone that is under the same roof gets invited to join in the work, uh, whereas the separated is that the therapist would meet with the adolescent for some general support for about 20 minutes or so before meeting with the parents separately, uh, but with the same goals at hand, which is to engineer the parents' capacity to take on the task of weight restoration in the early part of treatment. And so starting treatment obviously a little bit higher than you would typically find in inpatient settings because these folks have to be medically stable, 75% of expected body weight, and six months of treatment on average, about 10 treatment sessions, they were at 90% of ideal body weight. Uh, and then at two-year follow-up, they continued, irrespective of which kind of treatment of family treatment they continued to progress. Um, at the larger study that followed the pilot study, uh, this is a four-year follow-up uh, of the cohort, uh, and this color green is good, a uh, good outcome, red is a poor outcome, and irrespective again of which kind of family-based treatment, by far the majority of patients on an outpatient basis only uh, were weight restored and were doing quite well. Now, just as a reminder, for the simplicity of these presentations, we focus on weight restoration only. Um, but uh, as clinicians, uh, we full well know and appreciate that recovery is far more than just a number on the scale. Those data points are available, uh, looking at uh, psychosocial development, psychosexual development, and socioeconomic development, which is taken into account when people are put into that green bar, for instance. But just so as to point that out, we're not just looking at weight restoration, because as we all know, someone could be weight restored but desperately unhappy with that weight gain. Uh, and cognitively present very much the same way as he or she did prior to the onset of weight the, the, the start of weight restoration. So the first study to be conducted at this side of the uh, Atlantic was by uh, Arthur Robin and his group at Wayne State in Detroit. And this was uh, a, a relatively small study as well, uh, comparing two forms of treatment. BFST is Behavioral Family Systems Therapy, which is a very close relative of FBT or the Maudsley approach. Uh, for all intents and purposes, is, it's, a, it's like speaking Quebecois versus uh, French in Paris. Uh, it's the same language, it just sounds a little different. Uh, and ego-oriented individual therapy, EOIT, uh, which is um, a pretty active, uh, structured individual therapy to embolden the adolescent's efforts at um, uh, supporting esteem and e efficacy around taking care of her or his challenges in life without having to starve themselves. Um, so in this two-way comparison in terms of weight, which is the top part of the graph, the red line is the family therapy. Uh, family therapy was better at weight restoration at one year follow-up. Um, but in terms of addressing some of the psychological features of the disorder, the individual therapy was better. Uh, so it was somewhat mixed findings, tempered by a modest uh, sample size, uh, but nevertheless, as I always think of this, this is like trying to build a house of evidence. And whereas Mnuchin built the foundation or laid the foundation, this is only the third brick in this wall that we're trying to construct here. So another step forward to try and figure out what role families play or ought not to play in the recovery of their teens with eating disorders. <coughs> 
The fourth study was done by, by Jim and his group at Stanford, and this is now the first study to be conducted with the uh, family uh, therapy manual in hand, uh, the manual that Bill uh, briefly mentioned at the onset of this presentation, uh, and that's the clinician's manual. It's in your handout of reading materials uh, that guides the, the clinician step by step uh, through the 20 treatment sessions. The idea here was to see how much treatment is uh, necessary, a uh, so succinct summary of the study. And so there was a short form and a long form of this treatment. Short form was 10 sessions over six months. Long form was the standard, if you like, uh, 20 sessions over 12 months. Um, and this is weight gain in kilograms. And at the six month mark, there was no difference between the two, about five and a half kilograms on average was gained, were gained. Uh, and then the short treatment folks end the treatment at that point in time, but the 12-month folks continued to that point uh, and reassessed, gained on an average about 6.5 or 7 kilograms, again with no difference between the two groups. Just looking at weight at four-year follow-up of this cohort of 86 patients. Uh, this was the end of the study, uh, open follow-up yet again. Uh, and this is BMI this time around. So ending treatment around just shy of, of a BMI of 20 uh, and now uh, irrespective of whether folks received the short or the longer version of treatment, we're uh, presenting with pretty healthy BMIs of 21 for young adult females at four-year follow-up. And the same findings were evident in the eating disorder examination which looks at the, the uh, typical cognitions and uh, uh, thoughts and behaviors of someone with anorexia nervosa. Uh, a nice uh, move towards the, the mean, uh, and again, no difference between the, the two treatment groups. Clearly demonstrating that for a significant number of patients, uh, less is more. Uh, you don't need long intensive treatment provided that we can identify this illness early on and intervene appropriately at that stage. The fifth study was back the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, Simon Gowers, a child psychiatrist, and his team at Liverpool uh, did a large study uh, comparing, randomizing uh, adolescents with anorexia nervosa into three treatment groups. CAMS in a national healthcare system was treatment as usual. Um, so it might involve some family consultations, support of the adolescent, uh, monitoring the weight. Uh, specialized outpatient treatment was the second uh, treatment that you can be randomized to, which was outpatient CBT for adolescents with anorexia nervosa, or then the third arm is a specialist inpatient treatment for weight restoration. And the findings here are somewhat discouraging in the sense that uh, looking at one year and two year follow up, about irrespective of which treatment, about 20% of patients make a good outcome at the end of one year. Good outcome means weight restored, a very low bar, 85% of expected body weight or higher, and a resumption of menses, uh, and about 30% of patients are fully recovered at two-year follow-up, irrespective of which treatment they were assigned to. Um, the authors concluded that from the study, and they can, a lot more can be said from the study, was that um, inpatient treatment did not provide any additional benefit. So uh, un, uh, like the conventional wisdom that adolescents with anorexia nervosa ha have to be rushed to an inpatient setting as the first line treatment uh, that it did not provide a benefit over the two outpatient treatments. Moreover, that if you were admitted to the inpatient unit, uh, or at least uh, if you had to be hospitalized during the course of treatment, that it didn't necessarily provide any additional benefit. In fact, it often uh, started sort of a revolving door of inpatient management, not treatment, and there's a difference between the two. You temporarily weight restored, but if the parents or someone else for that matter are not uh, given the skills to understand and manage the illness when the adolescent goes home, you often have to go back to the inpatient setting. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to make a, a one or two points about this. Um, one is that the inpatient program was highly specialized. It lasted about 16 weeks. It was, um, it was the kind of thing people think they want um, in terms of uh, a treatment program. This was in the UK. They had the resources to provide it in a uh, full uh, way. Um, so this was um, not um, a 
halfway measure. It was a really good um, uh, inpatient treatment that uh, Simon Gowers put together. The other thing, though, to point out is that just because, on average, the groups didn't differ doesn't mean that some people didn't need one kind of treatment over another. So, so on the one hand, it would say, on the, for the most part, the study really, pretty com in a pretty compelling way, says for most kids with anorexia, you don't need to have a long hospitalization, long ho specialty hospitalization like this. But that doesn't mean no one does. So just, just to make that um, slight um, caveat. I think it's important that, that you don't take away from this that FBT is somehow um, against the idea of hospitalization, not at all. Uh, there will always be a minority of patients who require the services of an inpatient specialist team. Uh, and likewise, adolescents with anorexia nervosa are almost always medically compromised. And so uh, some medical stabilization is often required for a large portion of our patients. It's what do we do once the adolescent is ready to be discharged and at what level do we consider someone to be uh, suitable for discharge. And the, one of the premises of this treatment approach, and I didn't elaborate on medical stability, is as defined by the American Academy for Pediatrics. And that usually means that someone is at about 75% of expected body weight and there's no other signs of medical instability such as bradycardia, orthostasis, or dehydration. Um, and I think that's a bar that is somewhat different from uh, many other more intensive programs. Uh, and as you can see, the data is, is, is quite compelling that uh, if you're medically stable, uh, we really could and should attempt uh, outpatient treatment uh, with few exceptions. And so this is the sixth and the most recent uh, RCT that I'll very quickly review with you that uh, was conducted by uh, Jim's group at Stanford uh, and uh, our group at Chicago uh, and we randomly allocated 121 medically stable adolescents with anorexia nervosa to family-based treatment or adolescent-focused therapy. Just a quick flashback to the uh, Detroit study that I said was the first one conducted this side of the Atlantic. Uh, there's the comparison between what I said was Quebecois uh, BFST to EOIT, ego-oriented individual therapy. This is the same therapy, the AFT. We renamed it uh, adolescent focus therapy um, because we thought that EOIT is a bit of a misnomer and that AFT better describes the idea that you're trying to engineer and mobilize the adolescent's resources to become more uh, effective at managing uh, his or her challenges in life uh, through ways other than starving themselves. So that's a, it was a two-way comparison between FBT and AFT, provided 12 months of treatment and then a six and 12 month follow-up. And let me quickly run you through uh, these two uh, portions of the slide. It's a rather complicated one to read at the top because everything looks more or less the same. These three bars would be AFT or the individual psychotherapy, and these three bars would be family-based treatment. This is end of treatment, six month follow-up, 12 month follow-up, and then again, end of treatment, six, 12 month follow-up. The dark part of the bar is full remission, and up until now, the first five studies determined or defined remission as above 85% of expected body weight. A bit of a holdover from the adult field that, that somehow someone is recovered, more or less, if they just above the DSM-4 cut point, uh, to, to have a diagnosis of AN. Uh, working with adolescents, we thought that 95% uh, is probably a far more appropriate weight at which both psychological well-being and physical growth can be supported. So this is the first study where that bar was set uh, to what we believe is a more appropriate, albeit higher, standard. So full remission meant above 95% of expected body weight and thoughts and cognitions have to return to within the, the norm for uh, adolescent females, or adolescents, but mostly females, as measured by the eating disorder examination. So those two aspects have to be present simultaneously. The grayish bar, or the light gray bar, is partial remission, or are, uh, folks in partial remission. That's a uh, reflection on the old standard from the prior five studies, just to see how that would compare, and then the empty bars would be uh, 
uh, no response to treatment or unremitted. Um, so the findings of interest here was that at six month and 12 month follow up, if you look at this bar and you go to the percent of people fully remitted, that's about less than 20 I think, versus six month follow up in family based treatment which is closer to 40%. Uh, and 50% at 12 month follow up versus about 20 or so percent in the adolescent focus therapy. Those two time points, uh, 18 to 40 and 20 to 50, were significantly different and in favor of family based treatment. So at the end of treatment, at, at the end of 12 month follow up, 50% half the folks who received family therapy were fully remitted. And by fully remitted, again, these guys are now fine in terms of their eating disorder symptoms to get on with life compared to the number that's about 22% uh, in the uh, adolescent focus therapy. So a significant and clinically very meaningful difference between the two. Another way of looking at these findings is this survival curve, which looks at uh, how, how quickly does it, how much time does it take to uh, reach the 95% mark uh, of weight restoration. And of course, at the beginning of treatment, everyone, irrespective of treatment, would be below that mark. Uh, and this is how quickly this, this line here is family-based treatment, and the top line is the individual psychotherapy. And this is three months into treatment, six months into treatment, end of treatment, six month and 12 month follow-up. And just about every step of the way, family therapy was much quicker at adding folks to the weight restoration group. Uh, and the top line, family-based, ad the adolescent focus therapy, was a lot slower uh, in adding folks to who have met that bar. And we can go into detail about some of the other findings in terms of quicker out of the blocks in favor of family therapy, uh, maintenance uh, uh, post-treatment, again, favoring family-based treatment. So altogether, very encouraging findings. Just one point on this. You remember in the study that was just previously discussed um, from Simon Gowers' group in Liverpool, the uh, rates were about 30% that were meeting a minimal threshold of recovery. Um, and I just want to point out that the at, at follow up there, that post time two years, yeah. which is um, this was 50% uh, yep. at one year post-treatment. Right. And that's, that's a very good point to take home. This is one year follow-up in the, our study at a one year follow-up where 50% in family-based treatment was fully remitted, setting the bar at 95. Setting the bar at 85, only about 20% of the folks, irrespective of inpatient, specialist, outpatient, or outpatient treatment as usual, could closely get to that same level of remission. And that's much more what individual therapy, uh, adolescent focus therapy had. It was essentially 20%. Yeah. What that tells you, at least how I read it, is that a lot of approaches can get 20% of the kids pretty well, but it's a big difference between 20 and 50. Um, and, and when you're really trying to get kids well. And again, you wouldn't want to leave somebody with a little cancer um, because it has a tendency to become a lot of cancer become a lot of cancer again and this is similar here <coughs> so those those are the six published trials uh, didn't leave anything out uh, didn't selectively present them uh, that's all we have so in this house we're trying to build we have six bricks uh, and I think we have a fairly yeah, I just, I just, piece no, I want to say one other thing. There is one other study that was recently published on Psychopharm. Um, and I, I mentioned it because olanzapine is sometimes used by uh, psychiatrists to treat this disorder. And uh, uh, just recently, Jennifer Hagman from the University of Colorado and her colleagues published a study comparing olanzapine to um, placebo in a randomized trial uh, and found no specific benefit to adding it over standard treatment. So everybody got standard treatment and with and without uh, olanzapine. And so there, there is a psychopharm study that's just recently come out. So putting that together, even with a psychopharm study, uh, if we are um, adherent to evidence, to the evidence base for teens with anorexia, then this uh, is the treatment that at 
uh, until this time point at least, provides us with the best opportunity to provide the adolescent uh, with full recovery and ongoing parental support. So what are the conclusions we can draw from this? Um, that FBT for children and adolescents with anorexia nervosa uh, who have a short duration of illness is indeed the most promising treatment uh, out there and the only one with uh, a robust uh, evidence support. Um, it's also very clear, secondly, that most patients respond quite favorably uh, and contrary to popular belief after relatively few outpatient treatment sessions. I think the language that we use to talk about our clinical work as child and adolescent clinicians uh, is very different from the language that's typically used by our colleagues who work with adults with eating disorders. And it kind of makes perfect sense because if you work with uh, people in their 20s and 30s, 90% uh, of this time this illness onsets in the teenage years. So that 25-year-old or that 35-year-old has at least a 10, 20 year history of, of an eating disorder. We work with uh, adolescents who've been ill for six months, 12 months, two years. Um, and uh, as probably any other uh, medical disorder or psychiatric disorder would attest to, um, that if you have early onset, short duration, you probably have a better shot at uh, bringing about full recovery. The same that I always think about is that if I was a dentist, that tiny cavity, if I pick it up quickly and you attend to it, that tooth will last forever and a day if you did a good job at cleaning the tiny cavity. Um, yet if you overlook that cavity or the person with the cavity overlooks the cavity and they present to you with a terribly infected tooth, then you have a bigger job at hand with a much more intensive uh, process of intervening and maybe root canal or a crown. Uh, more expensive, more intensive, more invasive, and all together more complex. Um, I think it's fair to say that FBT, even if someone thinks that a 20 treatment session model over 12 months is a relatively brief intervention, there's a sizable minority of patients for whom even that might be too much. Uh, and that there's a specific group of folks uh, who can get by on uh, six months of half that dose. Uh, likewise, uh, there should be some flexibility in how we implement the treatment and sometimes you can vary from the conjoined model to the separated or vice versa. Uh, Jim and I are a little bit more set in our ways if you like just, just because so much of our work is done within the context of randomized controlled studies. But we really do want to provide the message that uh, one can be adherent to the spirit of this model and the manual uh, in your clinical practice uh, and uh, be adaptive in terms of what you're faced with uh, without having to steer away from the key tenets of this approach that uh, Jim will highlight uh, in the third part of this presentation once uh, I'm done here. Um, the fourth point is that the benefits of this treatment uh, have been sustained now in three, the only three uh, long-term follow-up studies that are available. So folks who've done well at the end of treatment continue to do so at four and five year follow-up. And that's pretty encouraging for any one of us in this room, but um, especially as clinical researchers, uh, you can get very excited about the, the effects of your treatment at the end of treatment. The proof is really in the pudding. Can those benefits be sustained and build upon uh, as the adolescent gets on with life. So what are the implications of these four conclusive points that I highlighted? That for now, based on the current evidence uh, available, FBT should be the first line intervention for adolescents with AN, provided that these adolescents are medically fit for outpatient treatment, and provided that their parents are uh, willing and able to engage uh, in this treatment. And again, from our clinical experience, that's about 90% plus of parents who, who present to us. Again, the onus is upon us as clinicians to mobilize parents, even if they're frightened, uh, anxious, overwhelmed, uh, and distressed by uh, the presence of the eating disorder. And even though their own challenges in life uh, might be amplified as a result, uh, we still, uh, within uh, reason, have to figure out a way to help them uh, do this tough job. 
Secondly, that most patients respond quite favorably after relatively few treatment sessions if the illness is recognized early on. Um, so in some ways, you know, a skeptic can say, well, we're a little, a little biased here in working with adolescents who've been ill for relatively short periods of time and saying that relatively little treatment is available, uh, is necessary. Uh, we s certainly don't want to create the impression that we think that's true for everyone. And we certainly don't want to create the impression that um, uh, we have a boutique practice where people have been ill for a relatively short period of time and we don't see the kids who have been ill for four to five years and who present with very complex psychiatric profiles uh, in addition to their uh, medical uh, risks. Uh, that is indeed true. And you may have to work a lot harder and, and figure out more ways to engineer the team to support this family and this adolescent. Uh, so it's not a boutique treatment for an exclusive a group of, of uh, very special patients. In fact, we just looked at some data from our site comparing uh, patients who uh, were seen in our general clinic versus patients who were seen in the RCTs and sort of a head-to-head -head comparison to look at the, the interesting and challenging point that people often raise that uh, when you do RCTs, it's this boutique practice. You include only a select kind of patient and you exclude all the complicated regular patients that people see in clinical practice. The, uh, uh, one of the, the, the nice or interesting findings from this, uh, this uh, preliminary endeavor was that, uh, in fact, the folks in the RCTs were, on average, more ill than the ones we see in our general clinical practice. Um, and in the Q&A, we can certainly talk a little bit about how few people we typically would exclude from RCTs, uh, and it's almost all comers. Uh, are welcome. The final point here is that speaking uh, purely as the clinician with my research hat off for a second, uh, we as clinicians are desperately looking for um, a handful of, of evidence-based treatments that we can implement uh, for our patients with eating disorders provided uh, or provi depending on the, the clinical profile and the strengths of the families that present to us. Um, we don't have that luxury. Up until now, we really only have family-based treatment as the first-line treatment. Having said that, uh, a sizable minority of patients responded pretty well with FB AFT, adolescent focus therapy. And uh, I think that if one is at one's wit's end and a family is either not available or generally not capable of rising to the challenge to do FBT, uh, adolescent focus therapy is, by, by anyone's standard, a pretty credible alternative for those families and patients. And so with that, uh, I will conclude the introductory piece as well as a brief review of the um, evidence. And before we move on to the fundamental assumptions, um, any quick questions before we move on? If not, you can write them down. There's a question uh, right at the back there. You can also write it down, hold it over to the Q&A if you can think of it only later on. Okay. Um, well, I was just wondering, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get to this, but um, will this treat, is this treatment as effective in certain um, cultural groups and um, races and, you know, I, I would really think about a lot of that um, and that level of support within the family, if a lot of it, the, fun, the family has been so dysfunctional, then, you know, the, the, the role of that parent and the role of that sibling, how, how effective can it be if you really don't have that foundation? Like what, some of them are in foster homes, right. some of them are in group homes. How would that work? Right. Um, I think that the, the, the challenge that uh, we always have as, um, presenting a workshop, and this is only a four-hour introductory workshop, this is not even a two-full-day training workshop, um, is that um, we, we are challenged with the idea of saying to you, this is what a typical, and I don't like the word typical, anorexia nervosa family looks like. I don't think there really is quite such a thing. Um, with a fairly straightforward comorbid profile and uh, a fair amount of resources. For training purposes, we kind of make that assumption because we can spend three days talking about all the permutations in which families present and how we have to be sensitive and adaptive as clinicians to, to make those uh, choices in the moment in terms of how we will 
steer slightly differently uh, on our track. So we don't want to create the impression that this one size fits all and this is how you do it. But for the purposes of this presentation, this is what this family looks like and this is how we're going to intervene. That said, um, any good therapist should be sensitive to the uh, variety of nuances in which our families present. A family in 2012 uh, is not a white mom and a white dad and 1.4 kids living in a white picket fenced house. Uh, there are so many different variations on that theme. Um, and despite the fact that uh, anorexia nervosa may sometimes still look like it is fairly homogenous in its presentation, that really isn't true if you go to a place like uh, Sick Kids in Toronto, which has a national health care set up, and Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne that has a similar health care dispensation where all comers are treated. I think uh, in, in our managed care and insurance environment, we do perhaps have a slightly different uh, cultural mix. That said, if we look at uh, the patients across uh, two centers, uh, it's a pretty mixed group of, uh, uh, in terms of both socioeconomic status as well as ethnicity or racial background. Um, and your, your point is well taken. I think I'm, I'm just babbling on to say that, yes, uh, although there are no studies that specifically look at um, the uh, effectiveness of FBT for Caucasian families versus, say, African-American families. Um, uh, we as clinicians and, and trainers are very sensitive to the nuances with which our families present. And whether it's a one-parent family, a reconstituted family, a family that has a, a foster parent or a foster home parent uh, to attend to the treatment, we try and work with what we have. Yeah, I, I, I just like to point out a couple things. We, we have actually, in the big study that uh, Daniel was describing that came from both sites, the big one that, that we talked about remission, um, we did two things, uh, we did a lot of things different in the study, but two things we did well is we recruited uh, a substantial proportion of minorities into that, those studies, about, uh, about 30%, um, Asians, Latinos or African Americans. So we, and that's much higher percentage than any of the other studies which took place in England or, and, 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 and it happens in Detroit. Um, so, and we did not, we looked to see if minority status as a group, even though that's mixing up a lot of apples and oranges and stuff, it did not predict outcome. Um, so that's important because at least there was a hint there that the approach could be used with different groups effectively. The second thing we looked at was family construct. So, um, and this was in that dose study. Uh, we looked um, at whether families were the original kind of parents with their biological kids or some kind of single parent or reconstructed kind of family, which is very common, right? And overall outcomes didn't differ, but based on family structure, but dose did. You needed a larger dose if you were from one of the families that had been reconfigured in some way or another. They needed more time to get organized. Um, uh, that was one of the things we found. The other thing we did is we included boys in our study, um, and um, that hadn't been done in the other studies, and so we had about 10% of boys. And we did not find a gender effect either, mm -hmm. meaning that the treatment appears to work for boys with anorexia as well as for girls. 10% um, is, is what you would expect in a population-based kind of um, sample, um, but it is a small <coughs> group in a study from which to do um, the kind of uh, uh, statistical analysis that would really help us. But in, in general, clinically also, we've, we've seen that boys do okay, too. So in the clinical things that Daniel talked about in the application, absolutely. But from a science point of view, we actually have done a little bit of thinking about it and are, are trying to provide, well, and what we found so far is that it looks like it works for other groups, too. It doesn't take away the point that there are families who cannot do this. So 
I, I know Daniel tried to say this and I couldn't say it more loudly either, this does not work for everyone. What is hard though, and I know Daniel would say this, I'm not that good at predicting. There have been families when I, that I would have said, oh my gosh, mass chaos, never going to work, um, families yelling at each other all the time, nothing's going to good at and they get it together. I have found other families who look like they are completely got it together on every level and they just will not face down the problem of changing uh, the environment that they, and the way it needs to be changed and <coughs> challenging the behaviors that need to be challenged. They just won't do it. So y it's hard to predict, uh, much harder than, um, than uh, as a clinician I would have thought. I've been um, humbled uh, by families and surprised. The, the issue that we have to really uh, work hard to move away from is um, the, and, and Yvonne Eisler, who is one of the parents of this approach, really reminds us of this, that um, you used the descriptor dysfunctional families. Many families are probably quite dysfunctional, uh, but, you know, don't we all kind of sit somewhere on that spectrum of, of being somewhat uh, funky. Um, so the, but the idea here is that, that what we should not forget though is that, and this is the chicken and egg thing, um, by the time a family shows up in your rooms for a consultation, um, you should be surprised if they don't appear quite all over the place and, and, and uh, besides themselves with anxiety and, and uh, uh, fraud with uh, uh, guilt and wanting to pull out their hair uh, because they don't know how to deal with this, this very confusing illness. Um, and I think as mental health professionals, we are very uh, quick, our jobs would appear to be one uh, to recognize psychopathology and find the, the causes of this disorder. And if only we can fix the family, then somehow it would fix the problem. Um, we're not going to work with perfect families because please show me the one family that is with, with or without a, a kid with anorexia in their midst. Uh, it again, the, as I said earlier, and I will say it again, the onus is upon us as clinicians to figure out what are the strengths that the family A or family B or family C brings to us. And for one, it's going to be a bucket full of, of resources and for another half a bucket and for others you really will have to scrape the bottom uh, to find those resources, but they're there. There are very few exceptions of a family that has absolutely nothing to offer to take care of their child. Uh, and and uh, they are far and few between. Even if it looks like the most disparate set of circumstances, it's still, without, without us being clinically naive, it's still our job to figure out what we're going to do to help that adolescent. And take the one that you mentioned that say someone lives in a foster home. They're, they're on, foster parents available, but there are these parent, home parents, I don't exactly know what you call them, who is assigned to be the parent to a whole block of kids or a whole hallway of kids. Uh, how available is that parent? What's the investment of that parent? And so on. But that might be the only parent that this person has. And so, yes, you can take this adolescent and admit him or her to an inpatient unit, and they can manage the weight loss and discharge this teen at a healthier weight, but who then helps the teen to manage this eating disorder so that she or he uh, has a chance to get on with life? So you may have to work with what you have and make the best of that person who is in some caring role and cares a great deal, although that care is spread across 10 or 15 or 20 adolescents. Uh, but that's the cards that that adolescent, unfortunately, was dealt with. So I think we, we the Again, without being clinically naive, the idea is always to dig very deep in terms of the resources that must be there somewhere, and you have to be creative as a clinician to help that family overcome that. And we've had families where um, in the middle of treatment, mother is presented with, is, is diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. A huge dilemma that's thrown right in the midst. Do you put the eating disorder now aside and say that's not that important? What do you do with this? You have to figure out a way for this family now to split their resources and taking care of two very sick members of the family. And so we just have to be really flexible and uh, have endless energy ourselves to be cheerleaders, so to speak, of these families. Because we have to, 
And so many families who've done well to come back to us and if they say thank you, it's always just thank you for hanging in there. Thank you for believing in us. Uh, thanking us for showing that we believe that they as a family uh, with the right support can get from A to B. Many families have said, all you've done for us, uh, this is not, well, all you've done for us is to give us permission to be parents again. Or this treatment is parenting 101. No, it's not as simple as that, it's not as straightforward as that, but at some level it perhaps is. Here's someone who says to this, to this family that you can do it without being clinically naive. You can do it and we'll muster the resources to help you do that.